The Haunting of Hill House didn't reinvent the wheel. It took the familiar tropes of the haunted house ghost story and pretty much played them straight, but did so with such virtuosity that it felt fresh again. As such, we can use this show as a kind of Rosetta Stone to decode how these stories work and what they're really all about. Hill House is as much a family drama as a horror series, which is what makes it such a compelling ghost story, because at their heart, ghost stories aren't about the horror, they're tragedies. Now, it certainly contains its fair share of spooktacular set pieces, and it's not above the occasional jump scare, but the meat of the series is in its character development, and that's what makes it great. Some of you may know that I'm not a big fan of The Conjuring, even though I can't deny that it's a well put together horror film, and the reason for that is that, as effective as it is, there's no substance to hang the story on. The constant barrage of dark, quiet rooms interspersed with screaming faces becomes kind of annoying after a while, and in the end, when Carolyn is trying to kill her children, it has no weight because these aren't really characters, they're just devices to move from one set piece to another. If the haunting isn't informed by character and emotion, then it's ultimately boring to watch, even if the horror aspects are well executed. Series creator Mike Flanagan said, It had to be about the way every family is a haunted house, and everyone is wrestling with their ghosts from their own childhood and beyond, that echo through decades. That's what I wanted to explore more of, more than the gothic horror and genre moments. Those can be tedious after a while if you're not focused on the characters. So let's talk about the characters and about ghost stories. And by the way, if you haven't seen this show, you should go and watch it because I'm about to spoil the whole thing. Trust me, it's very good. And whatever walked there, walked alone. So, The Haunting of Hill House is loosely based on a 1959 novel of the same name by Shirley Jackson, which was in turn made into a widely celebrated film adaptation in 1963 called The Haunting and a god-awful mess in the 90s which we will just ignore. Both the book and the film are about a group of strangers coming together to investigate the supposedly haunted Hill House, which, sure enough, does lots of scary things at them before possessing our main character, Eleanor, who has left behind her overbearing family which had kept her from the outside world as she cared for her elderly mother. Eleanor becomes so attached to the idea of Hill House and her surrogate family there that she refuses to leave and ends up crashing into a tree, killing herself, or possibly being killed by the house. The Haunting is widely considered to be one of the greatest haunted house movies of all time, largely because of its atmospheric cinematography and attention to detail. On its surface, it may not sound like much, but if you read into the imagery a bit, there's a wealth of great storytelling here. Right at the beginning, we see the final resident of Hill House climbing up this spiral staircase as the camera moves backwards in a spiral motion, mirroring not only the shape of the stairs, but the coiled rope this woman is holding on a platter, reflecting the very nature of the house itself. It draws people in, circling tighter and tighter until they can never leave, just as it does with Eleanor in the end. Or how all the mirrors that appear in the house are dirty, partially obscuring reflections from view, just as the house distorts the character's sense of reality, confusing them and us with its labyrinthine walls, its faces vaguely visible in the ceilings, or this establishing shot of the house, which looks like a painted outline then fades into the same shot the following morning. There's a vague menace about it all, but the truth is being obscured from us and the characters until it's too late. It's all terribly enigmatic, but where Robert Wise used imagery to obfuscate and confuse, Flanagan achieves a similar effect by obscuring the timeline, the very structure of his story, from us. The Haunting of Hill House presents us with the story of the Crane family, the residents of the titular house, before and after a fateful night in which the mother, Olivia, died under mysterious circumstances, and the rest of the family fled their home. Flanagan is deliberately vague about the timeline here too, simply referring to the flashbacks as then, and using match cuts with people waking from flashbacks that turn into nightmares, or knocking on doors in the past which open somewhere else decades later, treating the structure of the show itself like the typically confounding geography of a big haunted house. But instead of doors leading to the wrong room, they cross entire state lines and huge swathes of time. In lesser hands, this would turn the show into an incomprehensible mess, but Flanagan 
Flanagan deftly uses this disorientation to reinforce the main themes of his story, that it's not just literal ghosts haunting his characters, but their pasts, bleeding over from one time and place to another. The ghost is just a, a metaphor. A metaphor? For the past. Hill House has a lot to say about family and trauma and grief. The Crane children are each affected differently by their experiences at Hill House, and each of the first five episodes focus on one character in reverse age order. The older they were at Hill House, the more well-adjusted they've become, which creates a similar spiral feeling for the audience as we start with the relatively successful and stable siblings, and as the show goes on, we focus on the more disturbed characters and disturbing events of Hill House and their repercussions in the family's lives. The youngest children, twins Luke and Nell, are permanently scarred by the events at Hill House, with Luke becoming a heroin addict, and Nell never able to move on from the horrific ghosts she encountered there and continues to see even now. Like I said, ghost stories at their hearts are really tragedies, and I can't think of a single movie that has encapsulated this better than episode 5 of Hill House. The episode focuses on Nell, loosely based on Eleanor from the book and film, the youngest and least mean-spirited member of the Crane family. She has suffered from terrible sleep paralysis her whole life, during which she frequently sees a terrifying apparition she calls the Bent Neck Lady. Nell seeks out treatment, falling in love with a sleep technology who she marries, only for him to die. Having loved and lost not only her mother, but now her husband too, with her siblings all dismissing, manipulating or rejecting her, Nell returns to Hill House where she finds everyone waiting for her. She dances one last time with her husband, before what we know is coming because we know none of these characters are really here, and we've been hearing about this night since episode one. Nell's wishful dream is abruptly snatched away, and she falls from the stairs, the same ones we discussed earlier, and breaks her neck. And we see that all this time, the ghost that was terrifying her throughout her life was there to compel her to come back to Hill House, to confront her past, and in doing so, fulfill her destiny. Nell is the bent neck lady. This is horrifying, I mean really horrifying, more so than anything else in the whole show. It's not just scary because we can perceive a vague unknown threat, that's fine, but we can do more. No, this is horrific because the threat is fulfilled, because this was inevitable and Nell didn't escape. The most sympathetic character in this show is tormented, killed and forced to haunt herself and become her own tormentor. It may seem needlessly cruel, but like a Shakespearean tragedy, this is a deliberate and brilliantly executed emotional devastation. And just as Nell's story is so compelling because we see all the events that led up to her death, Hill House doesn't shy away from the human cost of these events either. After the trauma of their mother's mysterious death at the hands of the literal walls of Hill House, the Crane children build emotional walls to cope, which only serve to drive them further apart. As Stephen King said, haunted cars and railway stations are nasty, but your house is the place where you're supposed to be able to unbutton your armour and put your shield away. Our homes are the places where we allow ourselves the ultimate vulnerability. And the house itself is malevolent in this show. Like in The Fall of the House of Usher, the house itself seems to be linked to the fortunes of the family. In Poe's story, the house literally falls apart and sinks into the ground after its last remaining residents, the last members of the House of Usher, die, hence the title, which could refer to both the family and the house, because they are inextricably linked together. So in Hill House, the brief time the Cranes spent there in their childhoods has permanently bound them to the house, and two of them die there, destined to haunt its grounds forevermore. Mom says... That a, that a house is like a body, and that every house has eyes, and bones, and skin, and a face. 
Flanagan uses this idea of the house as a metaphor for the family unit throughout the series. The mother of this family is an architect and the Crane family after her death are like a building without an architect. The walls crumble and fall because there's no plan, there's no glue keeping them together. Without any guidance from their mother, the Crane children all lose their way and become estranged from each other. In Poe's story, the house is physically linked to the family, but here, it's not the literal house, but the household that crumbles into the ground after a death in the family. Ghost stories use the material to help us understand the ethereal, in this case, the physical structure of the house represents the lives and afterlives of the Cranes. In keeping with this, Flanagan answers the one question we've been dancing around this whole time. What is a ghost? In its essence, it's not a monster, but a person who has died, usually in a notably unpleasant or tragic way. The ghosts in Crimson Peak are closely tied to the house in which they lived and died, stained the same shade of bright red as blood, but also as the clay that the house sits atop, the source of the family's dwindling fortunes where these murdered women were thrown. But the key difference in Hill House is that we actually see the ghost as a living person first, not just as a backstory, but as a sympathetic character. We see Nell grow up, we see her happiest and saddest moments, and the house uses all of that against her. And it's precisely because Flanagan dedicates so much time to the stories of his characters and their lives and relationships with each other, that when we do get to the scary bits, they actually mean something. The horror has real stakes here, because we've become intimately familiar with these characters, we care about them, and we've seen through each of their eyes. Hill House has lots of great scary moments, from the loud jump scares to the labyrinthine halls of its titular house and the ghosts hidden out of focus in the background of shots for people to occasionally notice and go, HOLY SHIT! But at its heart, this series is about grief, as all great ghost stories are. It's about how the things that hurt people in the past continue to haunt them in the present, and how trauma can spread like a virus to other people just because they're close to someone who has been badly hurt. From The Shining to The Babadook, stories about haunted places are really stories about family, and how circumstances outside of our control can lead us to hurt the people closest to us. After all, who do you live with in your house if not your family? Ghosts can be a lot of things, be they warnings or malevolent manipulators or just memories of people we've lost. Every one of us will die one day, and ghost stories illuminate the real truth of life after death. Not literally, but in the sense that we become echoes of our lives, rippling on through the people who knew us. Terry Pratchett, a man who has died, once wrote, do you not know that a man is not dead while his name is still spoken? And the ghosts of Hill House and of all the great ghost stories are just that. They are the remnants left behind of people who aren't here anymore, but maybe their names are still spoken. Like Olivia, the first crane to die, says, We're all stories in the end.